Okay, it's 8 a.m. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Today's topic is on the streaming videos. And the motivation for this was I started getting confused with all the tickets. On, um, there's all these artifacts, right? Like you guys can, like, there could be video artifacts. There could be like choppiness on the streams. Um, you have all these settings in the cameras. You have all these settings in Blue Iris. I'm like, how do you make sense of all this stuff in a methodical way? And so I started going through this exercise and I realized like this is really informative probably for you guys as well. So that's why I want to have this, article, this webinar slash article to share the way I think about it now in terms of video pipelines and all the stuff that Blue Iris does and then how it helps me uh, answer tickets, but also it should help you guys to self-correct on, on your own. So I'm going to break this table down in a second, but let's start from the top because um, um, I'm going to have, I'm recording this obviously. And so I want the recording to include all the stuff in the article. So the, uh, I'm not sure if you guys were here for the first time I presented this article, but the motivation here was originally like a lot of you guys would come in and say like the, the cameras work fine on my app, but it doesn't work well in Blue Iris. And so that's where this article started. And then we got into like all the settings. And now I'm going to talk about how to like think about the settings methodically so that you can self-correct your streams on your own. Okay, so that was the issue. So the, like, why does it work on my camera app, but it doesn't work on my, uh, in, in Blue Iris? So I, I'll start with all the golden nuggets in Blue Iris. Um, first of all, it provides a lot of information. It tells you like your stats on a per camera basis, camera settings video. Um, so for this particular camera, is a two megapixel camera. The substream is at 0.3 megapixel, which is basically 640 by 480. I got healthy frames per seconds, you know, almost 30, 30 plus. My keyframes are plus 0 0.50. Ideally it should be 1.0, but uh, this is the best I could get because these cameras are coming across the WAN. And then the kilobits per second. So all these golden nuggets are in Blue Iris to help you understand like, are your streams healthy or are they good? And then in camera stats, the status log slash cameras tab, status cameras tab, you get a composite of all your cameras. And so this is really good too. So like with one view, like if you, if you send me the screenshot, um, I know right away whether your cameras are, are good or, or bad or where the issues lie. And so uh, this is really good to understand. And then here's a breakdown of all the information associated with it. Also, I, I haven't leveraged this so much, but like there's also other stats associated with when was a motion triggered, when was a motion identified, when did it trigger, when was an alert sent? Like there's a whole bunch of other stats, no signal stats. So like uh, it helps you really understand what's going on with your system as well as your triggers and alerts. And there's another webinar associated with diving th through all these different settings. I'm not gonna go through that because my interest today is if you got a bad stream, how do you quickly fix it? So you can go through all these details. These are all golden nuggets in Blue Iris. It's in the product and helps you really troubleshoot. Okay, so this is where I was at. Like this is where I was confused. Like you got all these camera settings, you got all these Blue Iris settings. So how do you, how do you, how do you make it all work so that your Blue Iris pipeline is, is solid, right? Like you got good, good streams, they're not choppy. There's no video artifacts like green bars and stuff like that. So I broke it down in terms of like, what are the camera settings? So here's most of them, your encoding settings. Um, each of these H.264, 265 encodings has um, profiles, baseline, main, et cetera. You have keyframe intervals, associated cameras. Now like, do all cameras provide access to all these um, uh, settings? No, but um, if you have those, these levers, um, you should take advantage of them. Uh, the frames per second is another lever. Like these are all levers, control settings, i.e. on your cameras that can help or hinder the experience you're seeing on Blue Iris. Just keep in mind all settings above affect the camera video node. Okay, so we'll talk about the pipeline in a second. Uh, one, one major takeaway from this webinar is at the end of the day, like we, 
blue wire supports standards. So H.264, H.265 are standards. All the other stuff that are in your cameras that your app may be using, like those are proprietary uh, protocols. Like if they have like, you know, H.264 plus, you'll see like these types of wording, like smart codecs, these are proprietary. So like, that means it's, it's, it's within the company's uh, IP, they don't share those protocols. So we can't get access to those streams using those protocols. We can only support the standards. So that's what, that's like the biggest takeaway from the camera strings part. Like we support standards, RTSP, H.264, H.265 encodings, and anything else can and could be problematic. Another big takeaway is like the profiles, like H.264, like some of them work well, sometimes high the high profile causes problems. And we try to document it as much as we can in terms of the, uh, the, in the IP config dialogue, as well as, you know, other articles that I create. Um, but that's another big takeaway. Like if you're having problems with encodings and you're getting video artifacts, um, reducing the profiles from like high to like whatever it's set at to like main or baseline is, so some of the some of the obvious things that you should do before you open up a ticket. Okay, now the blue iris setting. So now and blue iris is a ton of stuff too, right? So you got the hardware decode uh, settings um, that you can turn on and off, and you can turn it on globally. Global settings cameras tab. You can set turn them on on a per camera basis. Camera settings video tab. And so that's something to keep in mind. Like there's different ways to turn on hardware decode. There's different ways to turn on, uh, there's other settings in the video tab, like limit decoding unless required. And I'll talk about that. In terms of like issues that pop up in terms of streams, like uh, the biggest takeaway here with limit decoding is the fact that with dual streams, you probably don't need it anymore because the dual streams like alleviates a lot of CPU load anyways. And so this was, a, this was a setting that was used in the past because the CPU was being worked pretty hard with the streams. But with dual streams, um, the need for this has gone away considerably. Also BVR is another setting, like how does that play into um, your camera feeds? I'll talk about that. The record settings are important. So like direct to disk versus re-encode, like how does that, What's the meaning of that in terms of um, your streams and feed, you know, playback versus live view? Talk about that. And then the pre-trigger buffer, like for the most part, you guys use it because you like it. Like, you know, I have it as a set of five seconds because I want to see what's happening five seconds before the event. I kind of like that, you know, it's a user experience. However, there's some gotchas associated with the two. Like, for example, I mean, I'll get into a little bit later on, but like, um, if your keyframes are very, very low and you can't change them on your cameras, like they're like at 0.25 or something, you might have to play with the pre-trigger buffer to make it work with Blue Iris. All right, so that's a, uh, a brain dump of all the different settings on your cameras and all the different settings in the Blue Iris. So this is kind of like where I was at. I was like, so how do I put all this stuff together, right? Like, how do, how do you know, how do you fix something if your stream is bad? So that's where I came, so this is the uh, end result. Like, you know, I was working with the can, I was asking questions. So the table is kind of a, uh, you know, it's a lot of stuff, but once I break it down, I think it'll be pretty obvious. So what I started with when I went through this exercise was like, what are the use cases? So I asked Ken, like, you know, anytime a camera feed comes in, how do you use it? And then he told me like, you know, we use it for live view to console. We use it for live view to a remote device, like, you know, uh, your mobile devices or your, your your web interface. Some of you guys stream to a website, to your own websites, right? Like there's a whole bunch of ways you can use the stream. So I broke it down into like the big chunks. So like to the console, like, you know, your Blue Iris console or to some remote endpoint. And I'm, I'll probably need to break this down even more, but for right now, this is, pretty, this is pretty good. He uses it for recordings, right? So like when a camera, when the feed comes in and you want to record, um, do you choose re-encode or do you choose direct disk? So that's that's a, a use case. Playback, so like, um, then the other aspect of it is not only are the feeds coming in, but like 
the user experience, like you want to play back something from like the past, like a recording from two days ago. Um, that feed is not coming from the camera, it's coming from the file. But that being said, he's got to still deal with it, right? Like take it from the file, read it, and display to you guys, whether it be on the console, whether it be the endpoint, or if you want to export it yourself, like, you know, for like a 20p4 file. So these are all different video um, pipelines that Blue Wireless deals with. So once I got that, um, I'm like, well, so how do you deal with it? And so then that's where it came across. Like, basically I was able to abstract out all the complexity into like four nodes. Like first you gotta think about the source. Like, is it coming from the camera or is it coming from the files? Then you gotta think about uh, decoding it like you know you, you have to like be able to understand what the h264 or 265 streams whether it's from your cameras or whether it's from your recordings you have to be able to like understand it right like read it so that's that's his next that's why decode is here and then if it's going to a remote endpoint like a mobile app or you, the web interface most common places he's got to then like send it out out the wire right so like now he's got to encode it into a format that can be read by your iPhone or your Android device or the Chrome browser on whatever computer you're trying to like display view from, right? And then finally is the endpoint. So like it could be the console, it could be uh, the web interface, the mobile app, you know, like Ken's got like, you know, you, you can stream to YouTube, Facebook, he's got all these others, all this other stuff built in, right? Um, so, so yeah, so like that's kind of the way I thought about it. Like, so like I asked them like, what are the different things you do with the streams? And then what are the, based off these use cases, I was able to like tease out, like these are like the big, you know, hops that he's got to deal with stuff. And then I was, and then my next question was like, so based off of that, how does this tie into the blue iris settings? Okay, so that was my next question. So let me just summarize this table because this is like the this is like the biggest key for today. So you got the use cases, you got the different nodes, and the way I think about it is, I think about like where is it coming from? Is it coming from the camera or is it coming from the file? Live versus playback. That's like the biggest mental divide for me right now. So then after that, I'm like, all right, if I want to decode using hardware, like you know, there's hardware settings like do I turn it on or turn it off? And when should I turn it on? When should I turn it off? So like, if the source is the camera feeds, then the global setting, the, the hardware acceleration, you know, knobs, like on global settings, cameras tab or camera settings, video tab, that decides whether you turn on hardware decoding for a live camera video. It's different for recordings. With recordings, it's the also BVR. So like you can turn on, hardware for live, but turn it off for um, playback. And I guess the biggest reason for turning it off for playback, I, mean, I have it off, I think by default it is off, is because hardware drivers in general don't work well. Like one of the biggest value adds of Blue Iris is you can, um, you can, you can do this stuff, right? You can go back to a recording and then like all this stuff, like go back and go forward like this kind of stuff like on, on the hardware uh drivers i mean the hardware acceleration it doesn't it's, it's not it's, it's not a use case that's um amenable to hardware you know hardware card graphic cards in general like graphic cards in general take like likes a, a, a stream like a steady stream coming in and then doing whatever you want to do with it and then like sending it out to the display so like that's why you know games um, it's a constant fl flow coming in. So that's why hardware acceleration is really, really valuable for like gamers and why like for the live view, it's great because that's a constant stream coming in. But when you start doing stuff like this, which is like a huge value add for Blue Iris, like searching and scrubbing and trying to find like some point of interest, um, this use case isn't very good for hardware acceleration, which is why also BVR is a setting that you can turn on and off on playback. So that's the reason behind it. But now you know. So like now you know like what that means. Like it's more than just a hopefully it's more than just a button. And now you know that the meaning behind it, which uh, helps me a lot too. So all right. So that's also BVR. Encoding is pretty straightforward. So like you'll see the encoding. 
I'll help out if a screen shot here somewhere. Encoding settings. So that's kind of universal. Like here, here, here they are, encoding settings. And you see it pops up, pops up everywhere. And, and this is the reason why, because um, if you're encoding, you can use it for recording. Uh, if you're doing re-encode and recording to a file, it'll pop up. If you're doing remote viewing, um, you're definitely going to use it. You know, like how do you want the how do you want the stream to look when you when it goes out to the uh, the mobile app? How how does that stream get defined when it goes out to the the web interface? So that's a very common use case. And then also for uh, when you record a file as well, because what's happening is you're you're look you're reading the file. You're you have to like you know decode it again to see like what's in the file, like the video itself, and then you have to like send it out to the mobile device. So anytime you're sending it to like a remote device, there's always just encoding settings uh, applied to it, and it's the same. It's the same uh, same dialogue, but it pops up in many places. So that's so that's why it does, and and um, why encoding is so important. Like anytime there's a job associated with sending the stream outside of the outside of the, the server outside of you know, the live view, like you got to send it to a endpoint, but you got to like dump it to a file in MP4 format. Well, you have to like, you know, define how you're going to like create that, that stream. And so that's why encoding is pops up in many places. So that's a table. I walked through it. And so, you know, like it, it's, it's a, it might be an eyeful right now, but like, hopefully I walked you through the logic behind it and um, it's more digestible. Coming soon, direct to wire. So Ken's working on this part. So like to even streamline this, like um, there might be endpoints that can take the camera feeds directly. And so Ken's gonna like, you know, knock out decode and encode and like, you know, like go from the camera direct to the remote device. And if your endpoint can handle that, the camera stream, that's great. And you saved a lot of, CPU usage and you know all this stuff is, is a lot of work on the CPU and the GPU. All this stuff goes away and so and it becomes faster, right? So that's down the road, direct to wire, bypass decoding, encoding completely. And um, so more good stuff coming. All right, so now that I have this framework, it just became a lot easier to figure out like what's going on. So like all I really need to know now is what is what is the use case? So like, is it a live view to the console or is it playback to the console? Like live view playback is, is a big, you know, distinguishing criteria because playback comes from the files, live view comes from the cameras. And so like, once you know these hops based off of your use case, it becomes much easier to debug. So like, let me, I'll, I'll just walk through all the gotchas that have been documented so far and show you how like, it's, it just became a lot easier for me to like figure out like what's going on. Um, so like green bars um, on your live view. So like, obviously this is, you're, you're doing a camera, th this use case and even the bottom one, like the guy, you know, the ticket came in saying like, I'm getting, I'm getting junk on my, on my, on my consoles. Like when I try to connect to my cameras. So I call this like video distortions or video artifacts. So that's kind of like the bucket. So what's my video path? So it's a live view to the console. So all it is is the camera feed, decode, console view. Pretty simple video path. So how did what was the fix? Simplifying the encoding. In this case, we changed the camera's encoding from matrix for high to baseline. Alter the camera encoding settings until stream works. So simplifying the stream, um, I think for both these use cases, solved the, solved the issue. And but now think about it. So like now that I know what the, the path is. If that didn't work, if if the encoding wasn't solving it, what's the next thing I could do? I would I would check the decode stuff. So like I would say, uh, turn hardware decode to to no, like turn it off for that camera, see if it works. So now I know like um like once I know the the path, I know where I can affect the streams to make it work with Blue Iris, right? So that's like the biggest troubleshooting you know, making life easier on me on figuring out like how to break down the problem and and resolve it. So that's my first use case. And then in general, like always check your status logs. Like for some reason, like you guys will report the problems, but never like 
providing the details like the status log is and I, I, I keep harping on this uh, pretty much every two weeks because it pretty much tells you like if Blue Works is having problems, the words having problems and um, and so it really helps in terms of like figuring out like what's going on. And I'll just, you know, since it's so important to me, I'll just remind you, you know, the status button and the logs. Um, it tells you. And um, so I'm going to do another webinar on just digesting the status log. So um, that's coming. So it'll give you more experience on how to like digest it yourself because it is a, it is a, it is a lot. And um, once you once I show you how to do it, uh, it became, it's pretty easy. Okay. All right. So I this is the same. This is like another video artifact, but I just put it separately because I I just kind of like this ghost images stuff. <laughs> so I just do this in a separate one, but it's pretty much the same same scenario. So like console to live view is is a is a use case. You got some video artifacts. So the path is pretty much the same, camera videos, the code concept. I, 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 another reason I teased this out was because I highlight what, I, what, was, what the fix was. So like in this fix, we changed the camera feed, right? In this fix, we changed, the, I highlight the, you know, I ch we changed the decode. So this was kind of cool because like, here's a mailbox, here's a mailbox. And so it would be showing every, you know, it would show, the mainframe, the, the keyframe every two seconds, like whatever that, or every one second. But then in between, it'll be like all this stuff, like, you know, like these um, ghost images, right? And then we looked at the camera. It was kind of interesting use case because like the camera stats said like the frames per, like we, we said the iframe should be one. When we looked in blue wire, it was like 30. So like, we kind of had a hint that like, for some reason, um, blue wires was thinking that each, uh, you know, in between frame, between the keyframes, was a was a mainframe as well, um, based off of you know blue wires thinking thirty frames are coming in. So it was like interpreting, it was interpret interpreting the uh, the in, in the intermediate frames as like the mainframes and just showing it as is. And so you know this is obviously an incremental frame. So anyways, um, we couldn't. The camera settings were fine, like. I mean, we didn't know what anything else we could do here. So we ended up turning off the hardware decode and that fixed it. So once I know the path, I couldn't fix it here. So I, we turned off decode. Like, I'm not sure like why his hardware acceleration was thinking that the encoding and all the intermediate frames or mainframes or, or, or keyframes, but they were, and that was the fix. And here's some other interesting stuff that helped. Uh, if you're, if you're interested in knowing the whys, um, there's some more interesting details here that I thought was kind of cool with this case. So bottom line, like, you know, I'm gonna go through all of them. Um, the big takeaway here is understanding this. And then if you don't wanna understand this, like at least you can go to the different gotchas. You can identify which one applies to you and then maybe apply the same types of solution. So that's the other takeaway, like for, you know, the audience is wide, right? Some people are very curious. Some people just want it to work. And um, hopefully this addresses both needs uh, based off of who you are. Okay, so the next one is export to file. So this guy was sending MP4s, a 10 second MP4 to, uh, via, via email. Like, that was his alerting thing. So I knew it was export to file. And so that path, so export is, is you know, it has the most hops like record, it pulls from recordings, it decodes, encodes, and then saves to MP4, right? And the issue was every two seconds, it would be like the stream was good. And then every two seconds, it would be all, all jaggedy. Um, and so that was a huge hit because you know, anytime something happens on a consistent basis, that almost, al almost always means a keyframe interval is, is something with the keyframe interval is not being handled well. And so this fix was, so once I knew that, I'm like, well, do you have hardware acceleration on for your encoding? And he did, and he turned it off and that was it. So I got lucky here. So like, I, I just went, because I knew, I kind of knew it was like a keyframe issue. Like I, I'm like, well, let's start with the simplest thing first, just turn this off. 
because that's just you know like doing that is easy right like all you have to do is go to camera settings um where's the export let's see how do i get to that all right there's many ways to get to the export settings i'm just i mean this is the quickest way so um i'm gonna go here i'm gonna go to configure and then i just turned hardware acceleration to off so you'd have to go to the alert you know the email alert the jpeg and then do the same thing so there's you have to get to the right encoder settings but basically that's all i did was turned off hardware acceleration for encode Okay, mobile device playback. So these are these are common. Like you know, you're on your mobile phone and you click on the clip, and it's a gray screen or it's a black screen randomly. There's some other um, you know stuff like it hangs on playback. So again, um, I know what the path is: record, decode, encode, mobile. So now that I knew that, I um, I think I always go to encode first because it's like an easy fix as well as um, oftentimes it's hardware acceleration that's causing it. So the first thing I said was turn the hardware acceleration off. And then here's a copy of my encoding settings for my mobile device. It works for my iPhone. And so I kind of like recommend this. Uh, and so I publish this as well. So like this is kind of what I use and just simplifying the encodings to like this and see if it works is probably a great place to start. And so I think Again, this was the hardware acceleration. No, was the fix. But you know, once you know what the path is, there's other things you can try, right? So, like, since I know this is the path, also BVR because um, I can mess with the decode settings and the decode decode setting for playback from a, the source of recorded file based off of this table. So, if I will go back to the table, now I'll show you how I use the table. So, like. Playback to remote, um, same as above. So if I want to like mess with the decoding node, same as above, since the source is the same. So also be also be VR as a setting. So now that I know that, I just go down. I know this is the path. I want to mess with decode. So I would go to also be VR and then turn that off, for example. If camera's recording direct to disk, so like now like it's more complicated right like so like you don't know what's going to fix this i got lucky here like maybe that won't fix it maybe this will fix it maybe that doesn't fix it now you got to mess with the recorded file so like the recorded file is to think about that you get like is it going direct to disk that means you're taking the cameras encoding and um dumping it into that file so maybe that's too complex for whatever reason um so now if I want to mess with that part, if I want to mess with this, this part of the, the, the playback, the video pipeline, I would go and the first thing I would do is I would go to the camera and simplify the encoding on the camera because that's what's getting dumped to that file. So that's kind of like why this helps so much. Like once you know what the pipeline is and you know like this table, you know how to mess with these different nodes to like try to get your cameras at work. So that's the biggest takeaway here. All right, so that's kind of like all the video artifacts, like, you know, like the, the cameras connect, but, you know, the playback or the live stream is kind of messed up. The other aspect is the streaming stuff. And almost always this has to do with the camera settings. So like, um, I'll go through a, a few of them. Uh, let's over the first one. Um, what was this choppy stream? So like, you know, nobody likes choppy streams, like it's jittery and stuff like that. Um, the easiest fix is the, the biggest issue is frames per second is blue rising enough frames per second. Um, so I check out the camera stats, like, you know, go to your, you know, check out your stats. Are you getting 15 plus frames per second? Um, some of these like, you know, like 10 and six, like not, not, not that great, but like, are they 15 plus? If they're not, then you're not getting the frames. So that's how you go to the stats, find out what your cameras are doing. And then based off of that, go into your cameras and then, you know, trying to like increase that. Check out the camera stats. The FPS should be at least 15. Like, you know, make sure your camera's set correctly. Look at the keyframe ratio. Also, anything less than 0.5, 
may provide a better experience. So set the keyframe interval equal to FPS. And I'll go, I'll go into those details further down below. Reporters, your camera streams are lagging or sluggish or high latency on the console. Like if you got lagging cameras, um, oftentimes it's also it's a keyframe issue. Oh, here, here it is. So like all this keyframe stuff, um, the rule of thumb is uh, whatever your FPS is, make that your keyframe interval. So like 30, 30, 15, 15. Um, that's the rule of thumb. And you can, I've got, you know, I've walked through this example and changing it, um, but that's a rule of thumb. I'm not gonna go through this, th these details, but if the frame rate is 15, like all these iframe, you know, for the substream, it should be 15 as well. And the other aspect of laggy, the other gotcha with um, lagging cameras is your CPU is working too hard. So if you got, the CPU is at 80% plus, then it's probably your, your machine can't keep up with the, the feeds coming in from the cameras. And um, so then you have to go into the optimization stuff. So below are the general steps to tune your system. So like, you know, use dual streams. And then here's, an, here's the article that references how to set up your dual stream. Direct to disk saves, up, saves on CPU. And then the final lever that you have to like optimize your CPU is hardware acceleration. And so that's all, I give you links to like all those details. Okay, the last example, stuttering at common intervals. So this is, um, uh, this is, I, I'm trying to figure out how to put the video into these forums. I haven't figured that out yet, but once I do, I'll show you the video because it's easy, but like basically like if, again, like every common interval, like every two seconds, it'll like glitch or something. Kind of like the Jaggies example, similar, but different. Um, and um, so another fee that, another setting in the cameras that we don't talk about. And so again, like, you know, mentally go through the, go through your path. This is live view of a camera. So camera feed, decode, console, pretty simple video path. And then I focus on the camera settings. And in this example, this is like a while ago, I just, we just flipped it from constant bit rate to variable, like on the network. Uh, the encodings are so good and the network is so fast that usually network is never a bottleneck anymore. Like I shouldn't say that, but oftentimes it isn't. And so we just change it from constant to variable and then all that, that glitch every two seconds, like um, it went away. All right, the no signal gotcha. So this is, this is like a separate bucket. Like I put under streaming, but there's so many things that can affect no singles, uh, no signal. So I try to break it down into like all the different, you know, things that came in in terms of issues um to like help you we always tell you guys like um try to if there's like a, an issue like uh isolate the problem right so this is this is this is exactly how you isolate the problem so uh one one case with no signal was server power settings so like the the issue was um when he was in front of the when he was in front of the computer they worked fine but as soon as he like walked away um over time, uh, no signals would pop up on its cameras. And so it was a power savings thing. So like, you know, like on my server, like what I do is I don't mess, like it's running full throttle, like whatever, like the general window settings are for power for like when you're in front of the console. Only thing I, only thing I change in the power savings is um, the monitor. So like I let the monitor go to sleep, but I let, I, you know, the CPU has got to be running full throttle, like, like whatever normal is. Um, in terms of power savings. So that's one thing to look, that's simple to look at and figure out. So networking, if cameras are reporting no signal, our first concern the network is set up and stable, right? So like the, uh, the most obvious thing is, does the camera come with the camera app and can you connect the app to the camera? If so, then at least you know that the camera's on the network, right? So that's good. Now, the other thing is observe if the blue wires connection Oh, when you do that, also like look at Blue Iris, like does it wake up? Um, Cause you know, with these uh, proprietary encodings that could be the problem. So like, 
um, when the app connects to the camera, you kind of wake up the camera. And then if that leads to like blue iris going from no signal to showing the stream, that's a really, really good indication that you're using, your cameras are set up with an encoding that blue wires can't understand. So that's a good little tip, I guess. The other aspect is, um, so if you know it's on the network correctly, then if the camera comes with the browser interface, that's even better. Um, use the IP address, use any password, um, try to log into the camera. And if you can, that means, well, at least you know for sure that the IP address, using and password correct. And another golden nugget, like the reason why there's like that link in cameras video tab is because that's exactly to do this. So like you can just click on it, it'll pop, the browser will open up, it'll pop to the camera. It should bring up the camera login page if, if it does have um, support for a, a web interface. And then if you can log in, at least you confirm your IP address, username, password. So that's some of the easy stuff. Now, like, um, but you don't know, like, all right, so now, you, what do you know now? Like, now you know that your camera settings are correct and you know that the camera's on the network. So that's good, but you still don't know if, if, if there's something messed up with your network, right? Like, is Blue Wireless able to talk to that camera? Just because your app can talk to the camera does not mean Blue Wireless can talk to that camera. So an end-to-end -end test is installing VLC. It's a third-party uh, media player, kind of like you know, kind of like BlueWires, but it's not a it's not a security surveillance via video management system. But uh, VLC is a good test because you have to install it on a on a on a on a machine. So like you install it on your BlueWires server, and if you can get that stream from VLC, and I created an article on how to do that. So just walk through this. Um, I map it from like what you do in BlueWires you know, what you would do in Blue Iris and then how to like put that into the VLC app. And then once you, once you do that and then let, let, let the VLC run and like, and so then you know for sure, like at least you're not, like if it's not choppy, if it's not causing issues, then you kind of have a hint that um, there might be something with your Blue Iris settings. And if you can't connect by VLC or, or another third party app, then you know for sure like your network is having issues. So like that's a big takeaway. So like, you know, like most people don't think of the network as having issues. Like I know I don't like, um, but it can. And um, I have anecdotals of like people that let it replace the routers and cables. Um, so VLC will tell you if your network is set up correctly. And if it's not, here's some stuff that you could do um, to fix your network. Okay, so now, let's see, let's see. Now you've, you've tested your network, you tested your cameras. The other, this is like a smaller gotcha, I guess, camera hardware. Loss of signal could also be due to maybe the camera is being overloaded. So when you start pulling multiple streams, like it's more work on the cameras and that might be, the cameras might have crappy hardware. And so uh, this is another little test to make sure that your cameras are good. Like, try with one stream, try with the substream. If they work, and if you're doing dual streams and that's breaking, then, um, you know, it could be your camera hardware. All right, so where are we? At this point, camera, network, and the server have been ruled out, like in terms of the blue iris, the machine that running is running, that's running blue iris can talk on the network to the cameras. All right, now, so if it, so now you gotta dive into Blue Iris, right? So like the IP config dialog, um, I need, there's, there's a lot of camera gotchas that I have over, you know, I, I've identified over the years, like uh, not over the years, like <laughs> over the months that I've been tracking, but I, I haven't documented all of it. So like there's some here, like real link. I mean, that's a common one. Like I, I'm sure I'm, I referenced this. So like, these are like the settings on the camera versus, on Blue Iris that makes different real links work. So I documented that pretty well. There's some other ones. So this is the one that I need to flush out more. There's other vendors, um, the EasyViz and QC, like the IP config settings. So anyways, I'll continue building this out now that I have more time to do so. But that that's a big part of making Blue Iris work with um, 
making blue wires work with your cameras. And then always reference, I, I should put a link here, always reference the, um, let me go back, oh, sorry. When you connect your cameras and the IP config and you wanna get the IP config correctly, I mean, said correctly, like reference IP camera connections article, it goes step by step to all of them. Like yesterday I had to take it where um, they connected to an Amcrest camera with um, just generic RTSB. Um, and it, the stream kind of worked, but there were some issues with PTZ. I can't remember all the details, but Amcrest is a, is a strong partner of Blue Iris. So um, the step, like the step to go from generic RTSP to uh, the specific drivers that Blue Iris provides, somewhere down here. Let's see, I think it's step four. Step four, choose, choose. if he chose Amcrest in the model, like as soon as he did that, it worked. So like, um, all I'm saying is like, Onviv is great and it might work, but if you're missing stuff, then, and there's a listing for your make and model from Blue Iris, a 90, like 100% all, like of the time, that driver from Blue Wires is probably gonna resolve the issue. That's all I'm saying. Okay, back to camera stream optimization. Where were we? Down, 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 down. Okay, we finished camera hardware, IP config dialect. So, all right, so that's the first thing, like make sure you're, this is correct. Like if this isn't correct, nothing's gonna work, like bottom line. Um, and then you can, once you got like some kind of stream, uh, you could, it's, you know, it's, very, it's the, the video path is a feed to the decode. To, it's very, fairly simple, right? And so uh, I document this, it might be a little bit long, but I found this kind of interesting because uh, we get a lot of pushback saying like, I just upgraded Blue Virus and it doesn't work anymore. So it has to be the upgrade. <laughs> so, uh, that's why I documented this, but the issue was the GP, the GPU hardware. So, so the this user was getting really frustrated because one day he does an update and boom, all his cameras like blow up, right? Nothing comes, nothing comes through except like a few. And he waited for the next update. He was convinced that it was the, it was a blue wires update that caused the issue, and so he waited for the next one. It still didn't fix it. Still didn't fix it. So then he went back to my email and started um, dissecting it. The first thing I told him was like, maybe it's a CPU, maybe the CPU is blowing up with all the cameras. And so I told him to disable the cameras and let um, like just one of them that's having an issue. Like, does that, does that work? And that didn't, you know, obviously didn't help. So then I told him like, turn off hardware acceleration and then boom, all of them came back up. Like, just like that. So uh, knowing the path is important knowing the path is important. So I knew I, I messed with this part um, because so many cameras went offline. I figured like all the camera settings for all the other cameras couldn't be all messed up, right? So I, I started with the common denominator which is the code. So then it works. So like now he's all, he was all happy. And um, uh, so what we suspect happened was it was just coincidence. Like there was like a windows update uh, that resulted in a GPU update that um, that happened at the same time as the blue wires update. And so, you know, we depend on a lot of stuff to like get everything working. So just, uh, just a little takeaway that there's things outside of blue wires that needs to work for your feeds to work. And now I think, uh, so now we made the, uh, the software a little more intelligent. So like if you're having, if we're having problems with hard decoding with the hardware acceleration, uh, we'll turn it off or, uh, 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 behind the scenes, and but we'll let you know. So, like when you get these HWVA hardware video acceleration not compatible warnings, not errors in your um, stats log, that's why. And if you want to like resolve resolve the issue and you want to get hardware acceleration working again, because like maybe your CPUs are blowing up and you need the hardware acceleration. Um, the the straightforward thing you can do is like reduce the, the complexity of the encodings on the cameras. And then the other thing is you gotta wait for the next driver update, which may fix the issue caused by the current driver update. So like, you know, you, you have to work with your driver manufacturer. 
Okay, final action. So look, if you're still stuck, you still can't get the cameras working. If no single still not resolved, narrow down the issue by turning functionality off. So this is like turning other stuff off and seeing if that'll, if that'll res, you know, help the camera that's having the issue. So once you turn the shield from green to red, you like you, you've turned stuff like the, the streams are still coming in, but you turn everything else off, like the recordings, alerts, all that, all the other stuff. The cameras remain connected and the streams are live video. Do the cameras start working again? This could imply the CPU is overloaded when running normal. Normally, for example, storage, remote connections, triggers, you know, like your CPU could be like working too hard. And this is a good way to test that. And then temporal disable all the functioning cam, like, you know, turn off all the other, like I disable the functioning cameras like up, up, up above, simplify the video pipeline. And then, you know, turn off the other cameras and just try to get that one camera that's ha having issues up and running. And then, so in order to do that, you, um, you disable the other cameras, camera video feed, and then in the camera video feed, change the stream to the simplest encoding pro possible. Like make it as easy as possible for Blue wires to understand your camera feeds, and then turn off a hardware acceleration. Like, take out all the third-party variables and just let Blue Wires do the work and see if it comes up. Check status logs to see if if Blue Wires reports any errors. You may also want to consider deleting and re so you know, like, there's mysteries in life, right? And this is one of them. Like, there's a lot of users that have said that like they just deleted the camera, re re added them, and it started working. So you know. Definitely try it, you, you never know. And then finally, the cameras worked in the past. So this is kind of important. So like, if, if you know that if for some reason the cameras worked in the past and you can get it working again with the past re a version, you know, that's, that's good information to know. So like, if you do find that out, let us know. And then this is all the stuff, uh, it's pretty obvious. I won't go through all this stuff, but you can read this. Like when you wanna like, if, you, if, you, if you're still stuck, this is the information we need to like move forward. Okay, so that's getting, you know, your blue iris, uh, like once you see your cameras are messed up, they're not working properly, it's not a good experience, how to deal with the camera settings and blue iris settings um, to make it work. And the key is understanding all the different video pads, all the different hops, and all the different knobs associated with each of the hops. Okay, so just for completeness, um, that's the biggest takeaway. Um, if you're interested in knowing like how I came up with these details, um, I document that in a, like a conceptual article on streaming. If you're curious, like so, you know, this is how I investigated with Ken. Like I asked him, like Ken, like how do you how do you deal with all the video streams? And he told me like there's live view, there's remote, and then I asked him like what are the different hops for each one. And then I came up with the different use cases Then I normalized it. So like, you know, like instead of saying camera feed versus beat file, I, I just said source, you know, like I normalize it into like some generic called source. So anyways, um, that's my thought process. And then once I got to a normalized, um, a normalized um, pipeline that could be applied to all the different use cases, then I asked Ken, like, how do I how do I mess with each of these nodes? And then he then he showed me like from the um, from the Blue Iris app, blah blah blah. Like you can go through all this stuff. That's how I knew what also BVR was, versus just being like a checkbox. <laughs> that I was like, all right. Instead of like like tr just try it or like uncheck it or check it. Like now I know when it applies as well as like what it really means. Um, so it gave me a much better understanding of like all these little, you know, these are these like check boxes and list boxes, doesn't really give you any context, right? So like, and hopefully this provides a context. And then from there, we talked about encoding and he showed me like how encoding options, it's universal, but applies to like different use cases. So that's why it pops up in many different places. And that's how I got to this table. So anyways, if you wanna like dive deeper into like all this stuff, you can, it's available. And that's everything I had for today.
Okay, let's open it up for questions, comments. Um, if there's a raise hand, if you have a question that you want to ask live, um, raise your hand and I'll activate you. Laverne, allowed to talk. Oh, Ken, did, uh, did you want to chime in or anything that if I, in case I miss anything, I, I went through a lot of stuff in an hour, but <laughs> uh, please do so. Well, very interesting stuff. Thanks, Sam. Jeff, allowed to talk. Laverne, I think you're unmuted. You can talk if you, if you want to. Sam said he has an easy viz post that I'm looking for. Oh, I maybe. Um, outside of real link, I have a few. Let's see, where is that? That was in no signal. Okay. IP config. So where here we go. Camera gotchas. Oh yeah, you're right. I do have an easy viz. This is for the doorbell. Um, they had to change it from high def standard def to high. Wait, the fix in the camera app changed standard def to high def for ultra def. Um, yeah, I'm not sure who's asking that question, but um, if you go to IP config section, the camera gotchas has a, a little thing on the easy viz doorbell. Yeah. Did somebody have a question? Is somebody live? Can you hear me now? Yeah, hey, Jeff. Oh, OK, great. great. I have I a, a have question, question that kind of sidestep a little bit here, though. Um, um, I, have I have two, two servers. servers. They're both, both using, using uh, the, same the same blue, blue iris. iris. I'm using re release 5.4.9.13, which is the latest version. And one is the only difference between my two servers that I can see is one is a Windows 10 machine and one is a Windows 7 machine. So when I go to the clips on the console and I right click on a clip and I say, move the clip to another folder, like say, yeah. And then like I go to move. Now if I wanna move it to like the stored folder, for example, on one machine, on my Windows 10 machine, it, it actually, actually copies, copies it rather than moving it on the Windows 7 machine. It, it actually does move it. It disappears from the list and it gets moved. So I don't know if you could try it right now and see. Oh, OK. Oh, I don't have I only have new like uh, stored is I did not know what stored is. <laughs> Let me see. Gee, oh, there's a store. OK, I can try it. For the for the alert or for the clip? Uh, well, any of the clips in the in the list. Okay. And then move. I say yeah, move to store. Okay, okay, so that's what I'm getting on my Windows 10. So see how the well, see how it got marked with the additional it says stored on the bottom now. Which yeah. one was it? Oh yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's what I'm getting on my Windows 10 machine. Now on my Windows 7 machine, Windows 7 X64 uh, Pro, um, that server actually moves the clip. It disappears from the list and it appears in the stored folder. Windows 10 machine does exactly what yours just did. So I was wondering if you had some enlightenment. Is it, is it because of the OS or? Well, wait, let me check if it moved. Like, um, I'm assuming it did. Yeah. Yeah, well, actually copied in this case. And what you're seeing at the top of the list where it says all clips, that's including new plus stores. If you want to see that it disappeared from new, uh, Sam, go to select new at the top. Oh, maybe that's, instead of, um, maybe that's what I was doing too. Oh, so, so it did move it, right? I mean, that's what, I, I think that's the conclusion here. Okay, okay, so maybe that's what I was doing. I had one set for all clips and one set for new. Right, so, right, right, yeah. So I, I have an additional follow-up to that, though. Um, 
if the clip is marked protected, can you still move it? If you right click on the clip, on any of the clips, and then you flag it uh, protected. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. I, I thought, I was thinking that Ken would just know the answer to that. Um, yeah, you would, uh, <laughs> yes, you should still be able to move it manually. Um, the difference is with protected, um, it won't move it or delete it automatically. Um, it will also stop you from deleting it manually, I believe. It'll no notify you that it's uh, protected just in case you've selected a, a bunch and there's a protected one among them. It'll tell you that it can't uh, delete one of them. But you should be able to move it uh, manually. It just won't be moved automatically. Yeah, so the reason what I'm getting at here is um, I submitted a request, a, a ticket a while back. Um, I don't want to get too complicated here, but in the, in the uh, Sam, if you could go to the uh, settings for the clips archiving, where you have the three options there, delete, recycle, and move. Uh, what I was asking about, uh, Ken had wrote back to me about it, was the move being a separate function, the keyword here, separate. Because right now it's just either, you either delete, recycle, or move. And my suggestion was if you have the move as a separate function, you could, for example, say delete clips after 30 days, move clips after 60 days, because the only clips that will be left after 60 days are the ones that weren't deleted, which were the ones that were flagged, the ones that are important, important to you, if you follow what I'm saying. So you would say delete clips after 30 days, the only clips that are left after 30 days are the ones that weren't deleted because you protected them by flagging them. And then you say, after 60 days, I want to move those to a stored folder. Um, but Ken, uh, you wrote back to me and said that the move should also stop things, the protect should also stop things from being moved and that that wouldn't work. But what I've seen here is that they, the, even if they're protected, they can be moved. But why do you care? Like, where it's stored? Like, if it's protected, it's protected. Whether it's a new or stored, it's still protected. Well, so. if they're, I'm just talking about ones that are flagged. If they're flagged, you know, you flag them because you know, there's something important there that you wanted to, to take note of. So after 60 days, I just wanted to automatically move all the flag clips to another storage. But uh, that's, that's my point. Like, well, like, why aren't you thinking about it in terms of, like, new is, what, like, your hard drive has like 10 gigs so like new is 10 gigs bottom line now whether you decide to flag something or not flag something that's up to you but that being said if it's flagged it's not going to be deleted so like whenever like whatever your hard drive has it'll move it to stored if it's flagged anyways it won't be deleted so like why do you care right. like if it's flagged and stored in new for 30 days or like moved after 60 days well just to get them out, get them out, out of the way, way so they're not on the current uh you know, yeah, alert, alert list, maybe move them to a NAS box. Yeah, I understand. I mean, let's take, I'm, I mean, well, Ken's already addressed this. So like, uh, I don't quite see the, uh, like, to be honest, I don't quite see like what the value of that is. Like, um, like the, the way to think about it is just like, I got this much storage in like SSD, you know, like your new folder is like, you got like whatever, 30 gigs. And so that's what you allocate to Blue Iris. And now you decide to like store stuff, like you flag it. That's fine. Like that's part of the user interface. And then like after 30 days, you decide like from new it's got to go to store because you don't want to like blow up your storage, right? And so, and so you just think of it that way. And so like whether the protected files are stored in new or- well, It's more like, like it's, it's, I guess it's, it's just, just more like, like uh, I'm thinking of it as archiving, archiving. just archiving. archiving. Uh, uh, flag, flag clips because it's, it's not, not just me that's using. Uh, you know, we have different servers. Oh, I see what you're saying. You want to you want to filter. You want to say like only only save the, the flag clips. Right, right, right. Oh, I see. Like, um, I'm. Well, I mean, we can't decide that right now, but uh, Ken will think about it. I guess. Okay. okay. Fair, Fair enough. enough. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks, Thanks Sam. Sam. Okay.
Any other questions? Quiet day. Laverne is muted, but raise hand. Alan, raise hand. Allowed to talk. Oh, everyone's chiming in. Frederico, a lot of whoever chimes in first, guy. Just hey, Sam. Hello. Hey, Alan. Um, I, not a question, actually. I just wanted to share something. Um, I've seen some discussion on, uh, I guess, some of the bulletin board forums about plate recognizer, and I, I hadn't played with it. I've been using DeepStack for a while. Um, and I did, hadn't realized that plate recognizer had a free tier where you could experiment with it and not have to give them a credit card. So I, I started experimenting with that. I actually had some emails back and forth with Ken and you uh, working out some of the nitty gritty of that. But the, uh, the situation I found myself in, which I think others may see is their free tier is 2,500 reads a month. Uh, which is great, um, but even I, I'm I've got one camera facing a quiet residential street, but it's not going to make a month at 2,500 images analyzed. Um, and their next tier is 50,000 reads a month, which was way too high. They and they have a reference on their website to offering custom pricing, and they didn't want me to share the exact details of it, but I wanted to pass on that uh, basically I was able to contact them and say, hey, can you do custom pricing for a smaller number of reads between 2,500 and 50,000? And they, they, they were, which made it affordable for me because there was just no way I was gonna justify, I'm probably gonna do less than 5,000 reads a month and I wasn't gonna pay for 50,000. Um, so for anyone who's getting into playing with plate recognizer, if, the, if you hit that 2,500 cap, um, it, they were, you know, they were very easy to uh, deal with and they were very quick to come back and offer me a, a plan that fit the number of images I needed. Um, okay, good feedback, Alan, thank you. Yep. That's how we learn. Uh, Quite oh Jorge allowed to talk. Ken, if you have if you see questions that are relevant to the group, um, I just chime in when you, when you want. Go ahead, hey, Jorge. Hey Jorge. Uh, good morning. Good morning. So my question is on the on the web server tab. The web um, server tab. Yeah, if you could go to it, please. And you see where it says, uh, you know the so you could bind. The IP address. For, it says, yeah. uh, so I'm using a zero tier, and um, I have a you know a different uh, address on there for my the VPN. Uh huh. So whenever whenever I do like a Windows you know update and the system has to you know completely restart and everything, it um it kicks that address out, and I have to go back in there and select it, even though I have the bind um you know the bind check check mark. Is that normal or is it a uh, is, it a, is that a bug? This could be an indication that the adapter was not available at the time Blue Iris started. So in, instead of leaving you with no web service whatsoever, it, it turns it off so that there's something. OK, perfect. Um, the way to um, get around that, this is um, not uncommon that you might have to set the service to a delayed start so that okay. the hardware has a chance to initialize before the software. Yeah, I do How that. How can I do that? Um, it's in, so you go to services and then it's here somewhere. Oh, here we go, automatic delayed start. It's right here. <laughs> oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That, that's my question. Okay, no worries. Hey, Sam, I actually have another follow-up question. I just realized while I'm playing with uh, my system here. Um, yeah, yeah, no worries. Go ahead. Yeah, for Ken. Um, so with Plate Recognizer, I'm looking at some reads I've been getting while the webinar is going on. Uh, so I'm using DeepStack and I'm check, I, I have the option check to ignore stat, detect and ignore static objects. But it looks, to, and then I've got the option check to only send confirmed vehicle alerts to Plate Recognizer. But what I'm seeing makes it seem like I am getting that those two are not uh, overlapping, meaning that I have a static parked car and every time motion trips because of the wind, I'm sending that image back to plate recognizer. 
I could be wrong, but that's what it looks like is happening is I've got image after image after image of the same car going through, going up. And I don't see another object that should have been confirmed in that image. Uh, well, there are, there are quite a few variables in, at play here. And you, you really hit upon uh, an area that could use a little more tweaking, which is the, uh, the static object detection. Um, the thing I'm finding now that uh, we've been using this for a while is that um, sometimes DeepStack will not see something and then it will see it, even though it's never left the scene. Uh, there could be lighting changes and so on. So there could be some need to um, have more of a, a history instead of what it's doing right now is basically maintaining the previous set of objects and comparing that to the new set of objects. There may be some more intelligence that has to go into that so that it um, has more of a history over time. Uh, but to your point, if it's once it's triggered and there is a car there at all, um, if it's marked as a car, which shouldn't be the static object unless that, like I said, is, is not operating as efficiently as it should. Um, but it does send the entire image to deep, to uh, play recognizer. So um, it's not cropped out in a way uh, where it's only seeing the non-static objects, which, you know, speaking out loud, you know, this does need some more, more tweaking, like I said. I, I think I actually see what happened. It was subtle. I had to enlarge the image. The, the part car, um, it looks like the, the back of it is obscured um, by a tree trunk. Someone, it, it looks like someone walked up out of view of the camera and opened the hatchback and then closed it, meaning the, the edges of this static car changed a little, um, but clearly the, the car did move. Um, it's, it, may have, it may have gotten a little bigger because because that the hatchback was showing, you know, in, in one corner of it. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think it, it might be what you're saying. It's in the details of, is that really the same object that it was? Because I assume you're you're looking at kind of where it was detected, the limits of, of where DeepStack thought it was. And to, you know, the human eye, it's clearly the same object. But when it just got a little bit taller in the back, it might have uh, not been detected as static. Yeah, for sure. Um, yes, if the trunk's open and there's a person standing back there, there's, there's a very good chance it didn't even detect car at that point. So that's like what I'm saying, it, it goes from one detect to the next, that the car is not there, or not detected, and then detected again, then it, it, it right now would confuse the static object detection mechanism because it doesn't have any history beyond the last, the last detection. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, we got a question. All right. Um, Laverne submitted a question. On the mobile app, iPhone, I get alert notifications. And if I click on the notification, I am taken to the clip. That's good. When I go to the camera's area in the app, do you understand what that means, Ken? I'm not quite sure what that means. Camera's area in the app, I the camera's tab, I guess. I do not see any alerts. Most alerts are there in the app if I go to the alerts, but some do not make it there. Any suggestions? I think he's, he's talking yeah, about confirmed so alerts. App, yes, we have the cameras page and we have the alerts page. Um, if you don't see the alerts next to the camera page, on the camera page, that means that the alert didn't actually fire. Um, so if it's only on the, the alerts tab, um, that could be the initial image that was taken um, for analysis, but it may be an unconfirmed alert. It has to be a confirmed alert if you're using AI in order for it to show on the uh, camera stand. So the alerts yeah. tab? Anyway, you should is... say, um, and this goes for anybody. Um, it's, you know, this is one forum for support, but uh, you could send images through email and we can, um, you know, get a better idea of what's, what's happening. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Laverne. Thanks, Ken. DeepStack integration has solved 90% of the issues I've had with Boy. Oh, great. Yeah, a lot of positive feedback with DeepStack. 
Uh, any raise hand? Am I missing someone? No, I don't think so. Okay, I'm just going through the uh, chat. Pro tip, and I didn't realize this, but in group settings gear, the spec the specified frame size drop down list does not have to be used. You can manually type in the resolution. This is great for those. Oh yeah, that's kind of cool. So um, I think he's referring to. Uh, so this is how this is how you define the um, the stream for the all cameras view that's going out to the different endpoints. So the resolution is twelve eighty by seven twenty five frames per second. Well, the five is is defined by the server, so that that's going to stick. However, so this part um, UI three is kind of unique in that you can you can UI three can instruct Blue Iris what what the streams should be instead of like setting them up in the server up front. So like what I mean by that is if you go to the to the user uh, UI3 interface, like this is kind of cool. So like if you're having problems with the stream, like by selecting it, like downgrading it here, like this is like sending commands to blue the server to reduce your resolution. So um, so if you know if you're having issues or whatever like that's an easy way to like adjust your stream coming into your specific pc to get uh, a, a good user experience without having to mess with um without having to mess with you know web going to the web server going to advanced like this is kind of hairy like instead of trying to trying to solve it here, um, it's a quick way to like, maybe get it to work from UI3. So that is, that is a good tip, kind of cool. It's here as well as here, yeah. Is it possible to connect Blue Iris to the real link NVR and get the camera? Ken, do you need we always do real in cameras. Do you have any thoughts on the NVR? Does that does that connect? I believe it does. Yeah, um, there. I, I am pretty sure there are customers using that. Um, if you want us to test it, just uh, I don't have one personally. I do have some real links, but not the NVR, the DVR. Um, if you want to send a, a WAN address for that? We can test it out more completely. Thank you, Ken. I think. Um, all right, let's let's final call for questions. Nothing in the QA that you want to talk about, right, Ken? Uh, no, that's been very quiet. Well, <laughs> I look over there's quite a few in there, but um, I okay. can't find them yet. It, it's better right now if people just raise their hand and speak. Then. Okay, final call, guys. If you have a a pressing question or some issue with your server, this is the time to ask. Alan, do you have a question? No, right? Sorry, forgot to lower it. Okay, well, thank you guys. I guess it's a, a quiet Friday again. Um, great. That, that, that means you guys are su su successful with the. Um, with your deployments and implementations. Ken, closing words before we uh, shut it down? Well, I wanna apologize for the couple of people who have Q and A in here. Um, it's it's too difficult to read this live and, and uh, decipher and everything. And we ran out of time. So if you could please um, just forward that to the support email, we'd be happy to help you out. And uh, have a great, uh, great weekend, everybody.